Hi everyone, it's Liam here from A Shot of Wildlife and today I bring you a very special video. I've teamed up with the Water Mills and Masters project to bring you on a walk through the Waveney Valley, starting here in Beckles, walking out to the Gelderston Locks pub and then back round the other side of the river. Let's get going. Beckles is a small market town in the county of Suffolk just 13 kilometers from the most eastern point in mainland Britain. For the first half of this walk, I'll be staying in Suffolk and following the Angles Way long distance path, heading west from the town to reach the Locks Inn community pub in the village of Gelderston. Unlike previous videos, this time I can guarantee that there'll be lots of wildlife in the second half of the walk, but I'll explain why a bit later. But for now, Let's see what I can find in Beckles. A lot of the buildings in Beckles are old and still have chimney stacks. These provide a nesting site for various species of birds, but one that is famed for nesting in them is the jackdaw. These are the smallest member of the crow family in the UK and are identifiable by their chalkboard coloured heads and grey blue eyes. There were several other common bird species making use of the wires and rooftops of Beckles, including this small flock of starlings, a chunky wood pigeon, and this pair of collared doves. These birds arrived in the country in 1956, but have since become one of the most common garden species. I moved on towards the centre of the town, hoping for a rarer bird sighting. Although it's great to see the jackdaws and the starlings and the doves and the pigeons making use of the rooftops here in Beckles, there's one building that stands out above the rest. This one here. Now recently there has been a peregrine falcon spotted on it, so I'm going to get closer and see if it's still around. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be. The peregrine that had been spotted a couple of days before my visit was a young bird and it hadn't been seen since. As gutted as I was, the resident starlings seemed to be enjoying the safety of their falcon-free flagpole. I carried on walking and after a short while began to leave the village. However, as always seems to be the way on my longer wildlife walks, the weather began to take a turn. Well, as is typical, it started to rain, so I've got my high-tech waterproof camera case out and I'm on the GoPro for a little while. But doesn't mean I'm gonna stop trying to find some wildlife as you go through this sort of farming landscape. The Angles Way is well signposted and soon I was away from the road and into a bit more open countryside. Well, as quick as it started, the rain has stopped which means I'm back on the good camera and it means there's wildlife to be found. Now just here in this field, the stubble's been cut and there's a pile of sort of rotten manure and hay and that sort of stuff, which stinks to me, but it means it's jam packed full of insects, which means it's great for food for birds, just like this pied wagtail. Pied wagtails are the most numerous of three species of wagtail that are commonly found in the UK alongside the yellow and the grey wagtail. It's obvious to see how they get their name, but what isn't clear is why they wag their tails in the first place. Theories include that they use their tail wagging to flush out insects or to communicate with one another, but the leading idea suggests that the continuous tail bobbing is a signal to predators that they're alert and will get away if they're chased. As I carried on further down the trail, a solitary tree stood as an outpost for a beautiful gold finch. It's quite unusual to see one of these red-faced birds alone. They usually spend their lives in loose flocks of up to a dozen individuals as they move noisily from tree to tree. In the next field over, there was another bird who would have happily given the gold finch some company, albeit in a snack and snacky capacity. The common buzzard is a large bird of prey that is found all across the UK. They are opportunist predators, although in reality 
a healthy goldfinch would be way too quick for one of these birds to manage. Their main diet is small rodents and occasionally young rabbits, but especially in urban areas, a lot of their diet is made up of carrion. This one didn't stay for long, and neither did I. The skies had got dark again, so after a quick look at some nearby non-native pheasants, I pushed on towards the pub. The next section of the route was through more open grazing pastures, separated with ditches of water, or dikes as we call them in Norfolk. Across the fields there are several pairs of mute swans. These are the only resident breeding swan in England, but in the winter they are joined by two other species, the Hooper and the Buick. Mute swans can be separated from the two other species by the black lump at the base of their beaks, which is known as a basal knob, and by the orange colour of their beak itself. Throughout the warmer months, breeding birds are very territorial, but during the winter they are more tolerant of each other and often gather around good food sources. Now I'm almost at the Gelston Locks pub, I can actually see it just over there in the distance, but before I get there, apart from these swans, there isn't too much wildlife around. However, there are signs that wildlife has been here. Just down on this decking, there's this. Now that is a pellet from some bird. I expect it's probably from a heron or something like that. As you can see, there's loads of little tiny bones in there. These are the things that the heron can't digest. So they sit around here in its crop and its stomach for a little while, and then they regurgitate them, just like owls and those sort of birds as well. From here, I got my first glances of the River Waveney. As I crossed it, to reach the geographical halfway point of the walk, the Locks Inn. Before I could sit down and take a moment, I noticed a small brown bird scurrying up the trunk of one of the trees in the pub's beer garden. This is a highly adapted and aptly named tree creeper. They are perfectly camouflaged for their lifestyle of searching amongst the bark of trees for invertebrates. They have a specially curved beak that allows them to grab these critters from small crevices and long claws which help them to grip on. They often start at the bottom of a trunk and then work their way to the top before flying back to the bottom to start all over again. Well here I am at the Locks Inn, about halfway through the walk. At the beginning of this video I said I could guarantee we were going to see more wildlife on the way back and the reason for that is because I've actually done this walk before. In the summer, I followed the route from Beckles along the river on the Norfolk side to this pub. So I saw lots of species and I'm going to include them in the footage coming up. However, in the summer, I actually caught a ferry from here back into Beckles. And I also saw some wildlife from that as well. Here's how that went. The Big Dog Ferry runs to and from the Locks Inn and Beckles from Easter to October. The boat itself holds around nine adult passengers and gives a whole new perspective of the river. Despite being low down and close to the water, the first bit of wildlife I saw was way high above, a marsh harrier. These birds were extinct in the UK at the turn of the 20th century, but thankfully recolonised a lot of the country, with the wetlands of Norfolk and Suffolk being one of their strongholds. Unfortunately, as good as the view from the ferry was, filming in a small boat as it moved along isn't so easy. You'll just have to believe me when I say that seeing this male kingfisher was much better in real life than the footage I managed to get of it. Along the route, the ferry skipper told me stories of otters and seals in the river in the previous months. How lucky would I need to be to see one of those though? More lucky than I am apparently, as all too soon the boat arrived at Beckles and it was my time to depart. Now that's enough dreaming about summer, it's time to get back on the path and hopefully see some things as we go back towards the starting point of Beckles. For the second half of the walk I'll be passing through the village of Gelderston 
before rejoining the River Waveney to follow the riverside footpath as it meanders back towards Beckles. Shortly after leaving the pub, I passed by a house with several busy bird feeders in a tree out front. There were three species I noticed in my brief time watching. This is a blue tit, a common yet strikingly colourful garden bird. And here are a small group of house sparrows. The birds on either side are females, with the male with his darker face markings and grey cap in the centre. And here's a couple more male house sparrows, this time joined by a great tit with its yellow belly and white cheeks. As I headed through the main village of Geldeston, I had to question who gave these roads their names. Perhaps this person didn't do the washing up, and maybe this person didn't do any chores at all. On the way past Gillingham, I've stopped in at this boatyard because in the summer, this water here was crystal clear and absolutely full with fish. Okay, so crystal clear may have been a bit of a stretch, but you can see what I mean by full of fish. These are all from six to eight inches in length those with the noticeable orange tint to their fins and tails are roach, whilst a couple of the darker tailed fish are bream. You might think that they would be safe in the boatyard, but whilst trying to show how murky the water was on my latest visit, I noticed this stream of bubbles. This is the unmistakable sign of an otter. Despite my best attempts to hold my breath and hope, Sadly, the otter disappeared out of sight and I didn't manage to catch it on film. However, sometimes not seeing something but knowing it's there just adds to the excitement of a wildlife walk. So I carried on with the route and soon came back to the river where I'd also had an equally exciting animal encounter earlier in the year. Now this great may look like a very, very unusual place to be finding wildlife, but back in the summer, I stuck my waterproof camera down there into the water and managed to film something I've never seen before. Here, attached to the grate itself were hundreds of fingers made up of a very special creature, the freshwater sponge. Despite their appearance, they are multicellular animals and they're a great signal that the water quality is very good. I knew the river was healthy, but what a great way of proving it. From here, I passed by a series of elevated wooden fishing platforms and couldn't resist taking a peek into the shallows. Along this stretch of the path, there's 10 of these fishing platforms. Now as great as they are for giving a vantage point for anglers to cast out into the river, they also provide a really good place to look down into the shallows and see what's lurking about. In the summer, I stuck the camera in here as well and here's what I managed to film. From above, the water looked clear, but as always, visibility beneath the surface was less than I expected. But still, it didn't take long for some fish to come into view. Just like those fish in the boatyard, these, with their forward facing mouths, are roach. They're a common prey species, so often stick together in shoals of similarly sized fish. This means that no individual stands out as an easy meal, and may also serve to confuse predators that try their luck. Back in the summer, this riverside path was full of invertebrate life. One species that stood out 
was the colonies of banded demoiselle damselflies that bounced from plant to plant. This is a male and he is guarding his waterside plot, hoping to catch the attention of any passing females. Slightly further from the water, I also noticed several of these dark bush crickets. These two centimetre omnivores have a very interesting breeding strategy, where each adult only survives for one summer, but their young spend 18 months as larvae before emerging. This means that odd year and even year crickets never meet or interbreed with one another. I came to this spot in the summer and it looked very different then. Here in the summer, there were several dragonflies basking on top of sunlit leaves. These aerial predators are masters of the sky and are able to overcome pretty much any other flying invertebrates, but they don't always have it their way. This broad-bodied chaser had miscalculated and fallen into the water. Its attempts to struggle free from the surface had only worsened its chances and alerted some opportunistic fish. Despite it being too big for them to swallow whole, I don't think it stood much chance of survival. Aside from that insect getting eaten by the fish and the amazing scenery, there was something else in store for me here. In them reed beds, I saw a cuckoo being fed. Cuckoos are famous for having their young reared by other birds, and here's the foster parent now. As you can see, the juvenile cuckoo is much larger than the warbler which is raising it. So in order to reduce the competition from its foster siblings, the cuckoo would have pushed them out of the nest to become an only child. I've seen adult cuckoos in the wild before, but never a juvenile being fed. This is a memory I'll keep forever. I carried on walking and came to another spot where I'd found some wildlife earlier in the year. It's a shame it's too muddy today, because again, back in the summer, I went down here onto this platform. Down there, the water's only maybe this deep, and there was lots of small silverfish swimming around. I think I did manage to get some footage of them back then, though. Here in the shallows, the majority of the fish were the same as the ones I showed you earlier, roach, but amongst them was a different species. This faintly striped green fish is a young perch. At just 10 centimetres long, it posed no danger to the roach, but adult perch can grow to more than 50 centimetres, and at that point they are ferocious predators, and roach are definitely on the menu. From here, there wasn't much left of the walk, but as I approached the outskirts of Beckles, I did manage to see a couple of froglets in the long grass. This is a common frog, identifiable by the two raised ridges along the side of its back and the dark cheek patches. At around 2 centimetres long, this would have spent the summer as a tadpole and would have only recently left the water. Along the far bank, I also spotted a bird which would be very happy to find the young froglet. Herons are ambush hunters and stalk along waterways and in fields looking for anything small enough that they can spear and swallow whole. Frogs are included in their diet, but they will also take small mammals, birds, and surprisingly large fish. As I carried on into Beckles, I passed by lots of boat moorings and wanted to show you a quick glimpse of this place from the air which I filmed in the summer. Beckles is beautiful.
and I've timed that absolutely perfectly. Just as I got back into Beckles, it started to chuck it down. So I've managed to run to the car and get here without getting wet at all. But unfortunately, that does mean that is the end of this journey together. If you'd like to find out more about the work of the Water Mills and Marshes project, then there'll be a link for their website across the screen here. And if you want to see the last time we teamed up together and I took a trip through the Halvergate Marshes, that video should be popping up here. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.